Hello, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. Let's go ahead and dive right in. So this video is the next in a series of videos I have done on probability distributions. And this one specifically is about using the standard normal distribution to solve or to answer some very real world questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the daily stock returns, primarily for Apple, for the Apple company, which I'm sure you've heard of. And then we're going to later, we're going to compare that to the daily stock returns for General Electric, which is another big company I'm sure you have heard of. So using the daily returns for the entire year of 2012, we're going to use the standard normal distribution to answer some questions about the probability for certain returns. So I like using real world data and we're gonna do that in this video, obviously. So this video is not about finance per se or anything like that, but you are going to pick up a lot of, you know, concepts related to finance through the learning of statistics. So that's the introduction. Let's go ahead and look at our problem. Now, a few reminder slides before we actually get into the questions we're gonna answer. So this is the standard normal curve. And I went ahead and shaded the area underneath it in red because of course that's what we're interested in. Now remember the standard normal curve, we set to a mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. And again, the standard normal curve is helpful when we are comparing data that is in different units and things like that. So I'm gonna be using the Z distribution and Z scores in this video. Now, if you don't quite remember how to find the Z score for certain values, just rest assured, we're gonna be working through several examples. So you'll kind of you know, remind yourself as we go. Now, in theory, this distribution goes from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. It never technically touches the axis down there. But for practical purposes, we always are almost always working within three or four standard deviations from the mean. Now we also know a property of this curve is that the probability underneath it adds up to one. So we can use these properties, the area under the curve adding up to one, the symmetry of the curve and things of that nature to answer some very helpful problems. Now remember, if the entire curve adds up to one, then exactly half has to have a probability of 0.5 or 50%. Now we can use this property to find sections of the curve. So we call this area in the red, the cumulative probability from negative infinity all the way up to our mean, which is zero. Now we call this the upper bound here on the right. So the area in the red has an upper bound that is the mean or a z-score of zero. So we can write the cumulative probability that z goes from negative infinity all the way up to zero, and that equals 0.5, because that is exactly half of our standard normal curve. Now we can use two tools to figure out the probability. The most common one, the one I use most of the time, is Excel, Microsoft Excel. So in Excel, it has a norm dist function. Depending on what version of Excel you have, it might be norm dist or it might be norm dot dist, which it is in 2010. And this function requires four arguments. The X is really the upper bound of the cumulative distribution or the cumulative probability you're interested in. So in this case, the red, the upper bound is a Z score of zero because we're using the Z distribution. Now the mean is also zero because we're using the normal, the standard normal curve. Standard deviation is one. Again, that's a property of the standard normal curve or the Z distribution. Now the cumulative field is either true or false. It's a logical value. Now we're almost always gonna be using true because we're interested in finding the cumulative probabilities from the left-hand side of the distribution up to whatever upper bound we are interested in. Now you notice this is evaluated to be 0.5, which is down there below the arguments, and it says formula result 0.5. So this tells us that we did enter our information right, and that the red part of the curve is exactly half or 
Now on a TI calculator, we kind of have to fudge it a bit. There is no key for negative infinity. But to do this, we would use the normal CDF function. Now well, that's located, if you press second, then you go to the VARS button, and that will take you into the distribution menu, and you will see normal CDF in there. And this also requires four arguments. The first argument is the lower bound, the second argument is the upper bound, the third argument is the mean, and the fourth argument is the standard deviation. Now, like I said on the calculator, there is no button for negative infinity, so we kind of fudge it by using the E key, which is there towards the center. So negative second, and you'll see the little EE, 99, that gives us a very large negative number that sort of functions as negative infinity. Now the upper bound of our area here is zero. That's the mean here. Now the next argument is also zero because that is the mean of our distribution. So our upper bound and our mean in this case are the same thing. And then one is the standard deviation. And of course we evaluate that in the calculator and we get 0.5000005. The little five on the end is just because we're approximating negative infinity. So you can use either one. Just remember that if you use the TI calculator, you kind of have to fudge the negative infinity there, but they both work equally well. So let's go ahead and dive into our stock data. Now what I did is I'm recording this at the very beginning of 2013. So I was able to go into Yahoo Finance and download the daily uh, price data for, you can do it for any stock, but I did it for Apple and for General Electric. So using that daily data, I could figure out the day-to-day -day return from one day to the next, and that's what I did. So here is our standard normal curve. It's a nice bell-shaped, symmetrical. Down below you can see we have our z-scores. z of zero is the mean in the middle. Then we have one deviation on either side, and then two deviations on either side, and then three, and so on. Now the mean daily, like day-to-day, -day return for Apple during 2012 was 0.11%. So on average, from one day to the next, the stock went up 0.11%. Now the standard deviation over the course of the year from day to day was 1.84%. So that's kind of the variation. Well, it is the variation around the mean. That tells us how spread out the returns were from our mean of 0.11%. So we can go ahead and align this information with our z-scores at the bottom. Now we do that by just adding and subtracting the appropriate number of standard deviations. So our mean is 0.11, so one standard deviation above that is just 0.11 plus 1.84, which is 1.95%. Then we add a standard deviation to that to get 3.79%, add a deviation to that to get 5.63%. And on the left hand side we just subtract, do the same thing. So we're aligning our actual values with our z-scores. Now we're going to use this information and this distribution, this curve, to answer four questions. Number one, what is the probability for any given day of a return greater than 0.5%? So on any given day, if we pick a day at random, what is the probability that it will have a return greater than half a percent? or 0.5. Number two, what is the probability for any given day of a loss greater than 2%? So I'm not going to really talk about negative losses here because a loss is going to be negative. So a loss greater than 2%. So that'll be down on the left-hand side of our distribution. Number three, what is the probability on any given day of a return between 0% and 1%? So sort of a slice of our distribution. Number four, what is the probability for any given day of a return or loss greater than 3%? So this is basically we're asking what is the probability of an extreme movement in either direction, whether it's a gain or a loss, positive or negative. 
So that will tell us a lot about the probability in the extremes of our distribution. So let's go ahead and start answering these questions. Okay, so here's our curve that we had in the last one. And I went ahead and put our mean of 0.11% and our standard deviation of 1.84% there on the left. And our first question is, what is the probability for any given day of a return greater than 0.5%? So first let's use this of our common sense. Look along our axis there, and where is about 0.5%? Well, we know it's going to be between a z-score of 0 and a z-score of 1. Because a z-score of 0 is 0.11%, a z-score of 1 is 1.95%, and 0.5% is somewhere in between there. So we know that that's going to be you know, where our bound is, somewhere in there. So let's go ahead and find the z-score. Now just a, a refresher, that the z-score is just whatever bound we're interested in, whatever point along the bottom minus the mean, all divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, we have 0.5 minus 0.11, all divided by 1.84. So we're just substituting our numbers from our problem and our mean and deviation into the little z-score formula. Now the z-score, remember, should be between 0 and 1. If we get something that's not, then we know that we've definitely done something wrong. Well, when we calculate that, we do get 0.21, which is between a z-score of 0 and a z-score of 1. Actually, it's about right there. So we know our z-score is correct. Now, what do we do to find the probabilities? Now, remember, we're interested in a return greater than that. So we're going to be interested in that point and higher to the right. So I went ahead and shaded that part in in green. So the green part of the curve, that's what we're interested in. That's the probability of a return greater than 0.5%. But how do we find that out? Well, we can find it out by realizing some of the properties of the standard normal distribution, or any normal distribution. And that is that the probability under the curve has to add up to one. So if we want to find the probability of the green what are we going to need to do first? Because remember, the way we're doing this, we can only find the cumulative probability from negative infinity on the left all the way up to our boundary. But we're interested in the part on the other side of our boundary. So how can we do that? Well, we can find the probability of the white part, or the unshaded part, and then do what? We can subtract that from 1 to give us our green part. So we'll go ahead and find the unshaded part first. So we can use Excel. So we use norm.dist, parentheses, 0.21, that's the z-score of our boundary, comma 0, that's our mean of 0, or z of 0, comma 1, that's our standard deviation of the standard normal distribution, and then we're using true, because that is true, we, ask, we are interested in the cumulative. Now just a quick point here is that the numbers in that function either have to be all z-scores or all you know, regular data. That norm dist function could have easily said, you know, what are we interested in? 0.5 comma 0.11 comma 1.84 comma true. So they either have to be all z-score type figures or from the actual data. I'm using z-scores because I think they're more helpful and we get some more practice in actually calculating them. So make sure they're all one or the other. So the probability of the white area is 0.58 because that's up to the green boundary. Now to find the green, we subtract that from 1. And that gives us the area in the green of 0.42. So what's the probability for any given day of a return greater than 0.5%? Well, it's 42%, so 0.42. The next question, what is the probability for any given day of a loss greater than 2%? Well, let's find our z-score first. Now, for a 2% loss, what should our z-score be? Well, if we look at our axis, a 2% loss is between negative 1 and negative 2 
standard deviations. So our answer here should be somewhere in there. So negative 2 minus 0.11 divided by 1.84, and we get a z-score of negative 1.15, which is about right there. So we know we're, we're correct in that. So what do we do to, to find this loss? We're interested in the area to the left, because remember, we're interested in the probability of a loss beyond 2%, which would be negative 3%, negative 4%, negative 5%. So that is to the left of our boundary. So if we go ahead and color that area in, we know exactly what we're looking for. Now this one's actually fairly simple to do because we're only using the cumulative probability up to that boundary. So norm dist, negative 1.15, that's our z-score we figured out there on the right, comma zero, that's our mean, or z-score mean, comma one, that's our standard deviation, comma true, that's a cumulative, and we get 0.125. So the area there in the red, the area below 2% is 0.125 or 12.5%. So what's the probability of a loss beyond 2%? Well, it's 0.125 or 12.5%. Okay, next one. What is the probability for any given day of a return between 0% and 1%? So we're interested in sort of a slice or a region of our distribution. Well, of course, we're going to have to know the z-score for 0% and the z-score for 1%. Let's think about the z-score for 0%. Where is that going to fall on our number line down there in terms of a z-score. Well, our mean is 0.11. That's a z-score of zero. So a percentage of 0% is gonna to be to the left of that. So we should have a slightly negative z-score for 0%. So we'll go ahead and calculate that. Zero minus 0.11 divided by 1.84. And we get a z-score of negative 0.06 which is about right there. And again, I'm kind of eyeballing these just you know, so you know about where they are. So that checks out. We know it should be negative. Now for 1%, so 1 minus 0.11, all divided by 1.84, and that is 0.48. But that, that makes sense because 1% is between 0.11% and 1.95%. So we're interested in this little slice or this section between those two z-scores. So how are we gonna figure that out? Well, I went ahead and colored it in. So this is just the same thing we were just looking at. And I kind of color coded everything so you can see where we are. Now I do believe my axis down there is kind of slid off to the side, so I do apologize. The 0.11 should be over underneath the zero, so my apologies but that doesn't really matter to help us find this problem. So we need the return between zero and 1%. So what can we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is find the probability, the cumulative probability up to 1%. So that's the purple there. So the cumulative probability all the way to the right hand side of the region we're interested in. So we can do that using the norm dist. So the Z is 0.48 the mean zero, standard deviation one, and true will give us the cumulative. But we need to subtract out everything to the left of our region. So how are we gonna do that? Well, if we sort of make this part red, that's up to the left-hand side of our region, we can use the same function to figure out that probability. So we'd use norm dist again, and we come up with 0.48. So the cumulative probability of the purple is 0.69. The cumulative probability of the red arrow is 0.48. Now we wanna find the difference, the, the sliver in the middle. So what we can do, we can just subtract. We subtract the red from the purple and we're left with the blue section that we're interested in. And when we do that, we have 0.21 or 21%. So the probability for any given day of a return between 0% and 1% is 0.21 or 21%. Now, our final question for Apple here, what is the probability for any given day of a gain or a loss greater than 3%? 
So we're looking for extreme values, whether they're positive or negative. So we need to find the z-scores for 3%. So that's 1.57, and that should make sense. It's between 1.95 and 3.79%. So it's about right there. For negative 3, it is negative 1.69, which is about right there. Now we're interested in what's beyond those towards the tails. So our extreme values in either direction. So that's what we're interested in. So we can go ahead and shade those regions in and we can use the same techniques to find the probability in each tail. But we're going to, have to do each one separately and then add them together. Let's do the left hand side first because that's the easiest. So norm dist negative 1.69 that's the boundary there on the, our left hand side of our tail there. Uh, 0 comma 1 true. So that gives us the probability in the left hand tail of 0 0.046. So we figured that out. That's pretty easy. Now the tail on the right requires us to do a little bit more work. Nothing too complicated. Remember we're going to have to use our trick here where we take the cumulative probability up to our region and then subtract that from 1 to get the brown region there on the right hand side. So we're going to add this to our previous 0.046. So 1 minus norm dist 1.57. That's going to give us everything to the left of our upper area we're interested in. 0, 1, true. And that is 0 0.058. So the probability in that tail is 0 0.058. Now it should kind of make sense that these should be similar because our mean here is, is it's 0.11, which is fairly close to zero. It's kind of a low number. Our distribution is symmetrical. So these should be fairly close, you know, off by a bit because of where our mean is. So what do we do? We've got to add those together. So 0.046 plus 0.058 is 1.0. 0 or 0 0.104 or 10.4 percent. So the probability of a return or loss 3 percent or greater is 10 over 10 percent. Okay so 10 percent of the daily returns for Apple are 3 percent or greater whether it's a loss or a gain. And of course that is a pretty volatile stock it can swing from day to day pretty far in terms of the return or loss you get from the previous day. So we can use these characteristics of the normal distribution to answer these very fundamental questions about certain stocks or even other investment assets. Now, I mentioned something before about General Electric. Well, the thing is, each stock in the stock market kind of has its own characteristic, its own flavor, its price movement, its returns, its volatility, and things of that nature. Um, how it responds to the overall market, whether it goes with the overall market, whether it goes against the overall market, or is not influenced by the overall market. So each stock is kind of its own personality. So we just looked at the personality of the Apple stock. So we're going to briefly look at the personality of General Electric, which is a very different company. Apple is a very new, innovative, fast-moving, fast-growing, cash-rich um, company. So its stock is a bit more volatile. General Electric is an old company, a blue-chip company. It's, it's settled. You know, that it doesn't have crazy swings in its um, prices or returns. So we should see sort of a different characteristic. So here is our normal distribution. Now for GE, the average daily return was 0.07%. Now remember for Apple it was 0.11%, for GE it's 0 0.07, so a little bit less. Still positive though. Now the standard deviation is 1.17%. Remember what it was for Apple? It was 1.84%. Okay, so you should already see a difference in terms of the daily return, and more importantly, I would argue, it's standard deviation in terms of its volatility. So we'll go ahead and put these numbers on our number line. This is the same process we've always been doing. So the mean there at a Z of zero is 0.07%, and then we just add the deviations for above it and below it to get our actual percentages. 
Now our questions are the same. Now I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna walk through all these like I did for Apple. We will talk about the answers here at the very end. But we can answer these same questions about General Electric and then compare the two. Now what I do wanna do is sort of show you, you know, begin to show you the fundamental difference between these two stocks. Now GE had a mean of 0.07, standard deviation of 1.17. Now, when we put those on the z-score line down the bottom, we can see that plus or minus three standard deviations spans, you know, minus 3.44% and 3.58%. That's for General Electric. So we can say that like 99% of the daily returns are going to be between plus or minus three deviations or between a loss of negative 3.44% or a gain of 3.58%. Now let's look at Apple. So there's our Apple mean deviation. Now look at the difference. The three deviations away from the mean for Apple are negative 5.41% and 5.63%. So two full percentage points higher on the extremes, on the ends. So what does that tell you about Apple's stock versus General Electric's stock? You know, hopefully this should be telling you something about where the price returns you know, lay in the distribution, um, comparatively speaking. So let's actually do this. We're gonna actually plot the curves, the distributions on top of each other. Now these are the actual curves from the data. I didn't just make these up. So we'll go ahead and draw the Apple curve first. So there it is. So this is the distribution for Apple. Now when I press the button and it draws the distribution for GE, how do you think it's gonna to compare to the Apple one? Hmm, well, what does that mean? Isn't that interesting? Well, there's our GE daily return, 0.07%, or Apple, 0.11%. So you can see the Apple one is a bit higher, but look at the tail regions of the distributions. Now the Apple curve is shorter and fatter in the tails. Now what that means is that there's more probability in the tails. There's more probability in the extremes than there is for General Electric. So General Electric's returns tend to be much more closely bunched around its mean, whereas Apple's returns are more spread out from its mean because it's more volatile. So what we can say is that Apple has a slightly higher mean daily return, but Apple also has more variation. It has a wider distribution with fatter tails. That's why the red line is above the blue line there in the tails. That means that the probability of more extreme returns, both positive and negative, are in the tails. Now GE offers a slightly lower mean daily return, but with much less variation. So if you have a, you know, a portfolio that's just General Electric stock, you don't expect a huge return day to day, but you also don't expect a huge loss day to day either. The returns kind of move in a narrow range. Apple is much more volatile. So you might look at your portfolio if it's just Apple stock, and then one day it's, it's down 2%. Well, that shouldn't surprise you because given the distribution of the returns we looked at, that's not all that uncommon. But of course, in the next day, it could go up 2% again. It could go up 2%. So that's just the nature of, you know, variability in stock returns. Now, we also, we can sum this up very crudely, very simply into one term. Risk. So which one is the more risky stock? Well, it's Apple. Apple, you have a higher 
risk reward. So you have a higher potential for a nice return, but it comes at the cost of a higher risk of a, a bigger loss. GE is a little bit less risky. And of course you kind of, you pay for that less risk with a little bit lower return and you know, you get a much narrower range of, of returns. And this is the whole idea of, you know, how you allocate stocks in your stock portfolio, depending on how old you are. If you're young, you might have more Apple in your portfolio. If you're an, an older person nearing retirement, to the extent you have stocks, they might be more like General Electric because you're not going to lose, you know, your butt in the market on any given day. You won't freak out and have a heart attack because GE moves in a narrow range. So just by the simple analysis, using the very simple concept of the normal distribution, looking at stock data, you can just download off Yahoo Finance or wherever else. You can compare these two things, you know, quite handily and learn a lot about them but you have to know the characteristics of the normal distribution to do so. Now, this is one more thing before I go on to the next slide, the second to last slide. I did not check to see if these returns are normally distributed, okay? Because this, this video is not really about finance. It's about using the normal curve. So if you're a finance purist that objects to me assuming the returns are normally distributed, fair enough. I accept that criticism, but again, I'm not trying to teach finance here. I'm trying to show people how to use the actual curves. So what about the comparison between the two? We never figured out the GE answers, but I went ahead and did it on my own so we can compare. So what is the probability for any given day of a return greater than 0.5%? Well, for Apple, it's 0.42 or 42%, but for GE, it's only 0.36 or 30 or 36%. Why the difference? Well, Apple has more probability in its tails towards the end. So the probability of a return greater than 0.5% is going to be a bit higher in Apple because its distribution is shorter, wider, and sort of fatter in the tails. Now, what's the probability for any given day of a loss greater than 2%? Remember, Apple was more volatile. So Apple, the probability of a loss greater than 2% was 0.125 or 12.5%. But look at GE, 0.038, okay? 3.8% versus Apple's 12.5% a probability of a loss greater than 2%. Okay, that's three times higher. So again, Apple has more risk in it. It's more volatile um, because it can go down much further on any given day than we would expect from General Electric. Number three, what's the probability for any given day of a return between 0% and 1%? Well, for Apple, that was 0.21. But for GE, it's 0 0.31, 0 0.311. Now, why is that? Well, remember for GE, the returns are much closer to the mean. They're much more smushed in because it's less variable. Therefore, it's going to have more probability in towards the middle of the distribution. So we expect a return on any given day from the previous day between 0 and 1%. It's going to be much higher in GE than it is in Apple. And finally, what is the probability for any given day of a return or loss greater than 3%? Remember in Apple, that was 0.104 or 10.4%. But look at what it is for General Electric, 0 0.011 or 1.1%. 1 .1 so the, for Apple, the probability of a return in the extremes is 10 times, almost 10 times greater than it is for GE. And again, that's because Apple, its returns, its prices swing much more widely than it does for GE. So you're going to have more probability in the tails of the distribution for Apple than you will for GE. And that's a very simple way to compare two stocks, or more, I guess you could, 
just using the concept of the normal distribution. Okay, so that wraps up this video. So a few things before we sign off. Number one, just remember, if you're having problems in a class right now, I want you to stay positive and keep your chin up. The fact that you are on here trying to learn, trying to better yourself, trying to further your education, that's what really matters. So always keep that in mind. Number two, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your colleagues or your classmates, put it on a playlist or what have you. That does encourage me to keep making them. If you think there's something I can do better, leave a constructive comment below the video, and I'll try to incorporate that so I can get better at these. And finally, just keep in mind, I want you to have fun, keep learning. Um, I really enjoy learning, that's why I do these videos, and I hope that comes across to you, and then somehow you can internalize that for yourself. So all that being said, I wanna thank you very much for watching. I wish you the best of luck in your studies or in your business, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.